written back over here with writers or whatever. So yeah, yeah, a little bit to what Khan said. You guys are doing with South Asia Speaks. I mean, help, trying to help foster connection and you know all that with some of the writers there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the translation scene there is amazing. Yeah, by the oh, way, no. yeah, oh. yeah, no, it is, uh, it is. Um, and that's the little bit I know, but I'm aware of it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. People talk about trying to get books from other languages into India. I said, well, within India, there's so many, so much. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And, and rightly so. Yeah. In fact, I just had a question from a friend who lives here who's got a, she's Pakistani and she has a, somebody who wants to translate books from English to Urdu. And I was like, I said, well, that may be more in Pakistan. Anyway, that's, I, I ref, I'm referring her to some people that would know. I don't know that part. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of that going on so or a lot of that you know there are people that know each other over there so yeah i don't know if you know daisy rockwell she does a lot of the english to urdu translations she's done more recent work hmm. I don't, yeah i don't yeah yeah I she, know, she's done some good she's done some good books she's great huh. yeah yeah I've, i mean i know well kamala shamsi's there in london but i know her mother muniza and huh. uh, in karachi and uh she and i were on a jury together one time and, and there's Amina Saeed, who I think is doing something with children's books now. Uh, she's, she was Oxford University in Karachi for a long time, but I think, anyway, so there's, I, I sort of, I know some of those people in, in a way. So uh, there's that, who, who would know more to that question than I do, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. but. Sonia, congrats on the, the great review so far. Thank you. Thank you That's so great. much. Are you preferring uh, doing the tour from your own house <laughs> or are you missing the kind of, you know, jet lagged performance in front of people? Um, this is good. This suits me. <laughs> this really, really works. I mean, of course, it's so much fun actually seeing readers, you know, that that's just wonderful. And uh, hopefully that'll happen eventually. But for now, I, I'm finding this pretty, pretty good. Oh yeah, I see our friend Mahmood Rahman is in the audience. He's, oh, a, he's, a Bangla, he's speaking of South Asian writers, Bangladeshi writer. Yeah. Oh, that's so nice to see him. To see his name. Can't really see him yeah. in any no, other way. But... No, I'll have to defer that as well. <laughs> it is true. When is the last time you made it to India since the pandemic? Okay. Have you been able to go or have you have you been in the UK pretty much? I've been in the UK since um, last January. I think I made a trip last Jan and then that's it. So that's exactly uh, my situation. I was supposed to go twice this year, uh, 2020, <laughs> and I couldn't, well, I couldn't go because of uh, the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. And now I might try to make a trip sometime in maybe in April or May, but... Oh, really? Yeah, just to see my parents. I can't do, I don't know how much I'll be able to do there in terms of reporting or, or research or anything, but um, if, if, the, if the situation there doesn't look too dicey, they're older, so I don't want to put them at risk, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I've also never been away from India this long, which is an interesting, uh, <laughs> it's, it's been interesting mentally, actually. Mm. <laughs> yeah. you, both have, you both have family there. Yeah, yeah, I have uh, all my family, um, and I yeah, I haven't seen seen them for two Christmases. Ooh, yeah, and that's you know the one thing that I always count on. So, but not it's you know the situation is similar for all of us. So. Right, right. Are, are they all in Goa? Your family? No, no, no. They're they're all over the place, but we congregate okay. in Goa. Okay. No better place to spend Christmas. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. In, in snowy Seattle, it sounds really inviting right now, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think if you two are ready, let me see. I think I'm getting the cue to from Karen. Okay, yes. Um, so we are all over the place in terms of time zones and everything else. So uh, um, on behalf of my colleague Karen and myself and everyone else at Elliott Bay Book Company in a very snowy Seattle where it is early, very early afternoon. Um, we are delighted you're joining us from all the places you are um, as today or tonight um, or even tomorrow if you're in that part of the world. 
Um, we have Sonia Falero here, um, who will be discussing her extraordinary new book, uh, the second book, The Good Girls, which has, um, I don't know if they published the subtitle in the UK or India, they don't always in other countries, but the subtitle, An Ordinary Killing, um, which uh, this book uh, is, Sonia Falero is a, is a master of writing narrative nonfiction, you know, extended journalism, which is also what she um, did in her first book, uh, Beautiful Thing Inside the Secret World of Bombay's Dance Bars, a book which published a few years ago, received a lot of global attention and was um, cited as a book of the year by many um, publications around the world. And in, but in the, the Good Girls, which has just been published here in, uh, in the US and just a few, a little bit prior in the UK and India, she tells uh, the story of two young girls, adolescent girls, uh, who are in a village in Uttar Pradesh who um, are found uh, killed and mutilated and a, a, a story that caused a national and I think even international um, viewer. And yet um, it's the kind of thing that sometimes in news accounts is there and then disappears. And she, in this book, um, goes and chronicles the whole, the, the whole story, um, including the stories about the story and does so in careful, insightful, and in sort of interrogative language. I mean, she really looks at it. She's, a, she's a extru an ex excellent, amazing writer. And that will be borne out a little bit. I think she's gonna read a little bit from today, but also she's joined um, in conversation by Karan Mahajan, who is um, joining us from a few time zones east, but not as far, e far east as London. Uh, mm -hmm. He's in Providence, Rhode Island, where he teaches at Brown University. And um, I believe Karen and Sonia have met in, in this kind of realm in Zoom, but not yet in person. So that's also part of how the world is. You get people sort of, you know, meeting with little quotes um, this way, um, but not yet um, you know, in, in actual life. Karen, uh, we were recounting as has been to Seattle uh, as recently as about four years ago. He's the author of two novels, uh, his first family planning, um, which was a finalist for the Dylan Thomas prize and probably receiving more attention was the more recent book, The Association of Small Bombs, which um, I think had, you know, he may have had interesting times traveling around the US as the <laughs> author of that book with the airport uh, uh, authorities. Um, and, uh, but that book uh, did receive a lot of great attention in the US. It was a finalist for the National Book Award and it received the New York Public Library Young Lions Award as well. So um, uh, that, book has continued to go into readers' hands um, in the years since he's been here and, and elsewhere. And um, Sonia almost got to Seattle when um, Beautiful Thing was out, but she was in California at the time, but didn't quite work out. So we're delighted that to have this occasion to be presenting her and, and again with a book that is um, all too timely and, and necessary with a story she tells. So I will disappear in just a moment and uh, <laughs> you will be in the good hands of Sonia and Karen. Um, if at a point well, we'd ask you to put questions in the Q and A, uh, which is a little icon on the bottom, and um, and Karen will at a point after you know they'll, they'll have their conversation, but he'll go for those and and work your questions in as well. So um, and I'll reappear at the end. Um, and uh, yes, I'm strange to be looking out a window here and seeing snow, seeing people shoveling snow. It's not a Seattle regular sight. Um, thank you both. Uh, thank you everyone for coming and now please join in giving good attention and welcome to Sonia Falero and Karan Mahajan. Thank you, Rick. Um, so what we'll, what we'll do is, is, as Rick said, we'll hear Sonia speak first and then I'll pose some questions to Sonia and then we'll open up the, the Q&A. So Sonia, if you wanna read the chapter, um, you said you would read, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is um, a chapter that's early on in the book. Um, it's called Lali's Father Buys a Phone. Cousin Manju was 12 and skinny with the radiant smile and point blank manner of all the Shakya women. She lived with her family in Noida, a heavily polluted industrial city, some hours away from Katra village in an overcrowded tenement with shared bathrooms. The walls of the building shook when trucks rumbled past. When Lali's father, Sohanlal, phoned to invite her for the school holidays, she was thrilled. 
it was mango season, and she'd get to see her first cousin, whom she fondly called Meri Wali Didi, my sister. Her uncle said he'd be away with his wife and younger son on a pilgrimage. Lali will be alone. It was understood that Manju, although she was younger than Lali, would look out for the older girl. Before leaving, Sohan Lal went to buy a new phone from Keshav Communications, which was located in the bazaar down the road from the cycle puncture repairman and opposite a snack shop that served Coca-Cola out of an ice box. Waiting at the door, sweat beading on his face, was Yogendra Singh, Sohan Lal's cousin. He was a plain speaking young man uh, with a rough beard, dressed like all the village men in a collared shirt and sturdy trousers made from a pale fabric, which better endured the heat. All day long, customers streamed into Keshav's. They browsed his affordable range of made in China phones, some of which had features that weren't readily available even in name brand handsets. Then, because they didn't have internet access, they asked Keshav to download the latest Bollywood songs by sideloading them from his desktop computer to their phones via USB. Most didn't have bar either, so they also paid a few rupees to charge their phones. As they waited, customers enjoyed the cool breeze from the whirring fan, gazing at the neatly ordered shelves stacked with boxes of cellophane wrapped products. Keshav was a modern entrepreneur and the village boys admired him. This afternoon, there weren't very many clients vying for his attention, but even if there had been, Keshav would have served the newcomers first. Sohanlal's cousin was Keshav's landlord's son. And according to the social hierarchies of the village, this made him the equivalent of Keshav's boss's son. Sohanlal wanted a handset with a long battery life. He was going on a pilgrimage, he said. It was time to get his youngest boy's hair tonsured and to pay respect to the mother goddess. Kesha brought out a handful of phones from under the glass counter. Sohanlal browsed them carefully, but it was his cousin who did most of the talking, asking about this feature and that. They settled on a shiny black phone with a gold and black keypad. Then Sohanlal asked to buy a SIM card but when told to provide proof of identity, which was the law, he said he wasn't carrying any. His cousin looked on inquiringly. 20-year-old Keshav made a quick set of calculations in his head. It was only here in Katra that he could afford to run his own business. He paid 500 rupees a month in rent, a good deal. He was in debt to his uncle who had helped set him up and he owed it to his widowed mother to keep things going. It didn't matter, Keshav assured the man. He pulled out a copy of another customer's identity card and entered the details in Sohanlal's bill of sale. Then, because Sohanlal couldn't write, he forged a signature on his behalf. What was more likely, he thought, the police appearing at his doorstep or his landlord's son getting angry with him for refusing to do as he was told. Keshav knew the villagers had identity cards which they used to purchase subsidized food grains and to vote. But he also knew that these precious items were kept securely at home. He often did such favors and had never yet been caught. He had no reason to believe this time would be any different. Sohanlal didn't take his new phone on pilgrimage. Instead, he gave it to his niece, Padma. Although it's unlikely she knew it at the time, the device had a feature that made it especially popular with nosy parents. It could record calls. The conversations were then saved on the phone. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, that was terrific. Uh, and before we start, I just wanted to also uh, thank Rick and Karen for organizing this and wanted to plug Elliot Bay, which is a, just a wonderful bookstore and encourage you to order Sonia's book from them. Um, and also to type out your questions in the Q&A as we're talking, because I, I believe it closes uh, when, when, the actual, when we start actually taking questions from the audience. Um, so, so before I, we, I, I quiz Sonia about her latest book, I just want to speak for a couple of seconds about my own encounter with her work. Um, you know, I, I uh, have read a Beautiful Thing and even taught it, her, her second book and her first book of nonfiction. 
and it really is a masterpiece of reporting. It's like wonderfully sort of plump with a particular kind of Bombay Hindi, and it captures the the vital but very tragic life of this um, of a single individual, this bar dancer in Bombay. And for me, what's amazing about reading The Good Girls is that this book is is as good, um, if not better, but in completely different ways. Uh, Beautiful Thing was, you know, a book that hewed closely to the life of uh, one individual. And here we get like a real panoply of, of Indian life uh, tightly held together by sort of expert, omniscient, chronological storytelling. And um, unlike in the, in the first book of nonfiction, Sonia doesn't bring herself into the story, but at the same time, she descends in a sense to the various levels of Indian life that come into play when there's a murder case that is being investigated. Um, the police, the families, the politicians, reporters, uh, bystanders. And she does an amazing job in this book showing us how misinformation and rumor uh, seep into a story, not just of a community, but of an entire nation. And um, in some ways, she also shows us the rot of incompetence uh, and uh, bypassing rules that lies at the heart of of Indian life, as you just saw in that excerpt where the cell phone um, seller kind of just quickly, uh, you know, takes down false information in order to register a new user. So um, I have lots of questions for you, Sonia, but I'm going to start by with a question about the fact that this is a story set in rural India. And I, and I remember you saying, when I've talked to you before on Zoom, that beautiful thing actually partly came out of you going to a rural area reporting on farmer suicides and becoming interested in a particular kind of life that is not reported in India. So I'm wondering, that ended up being a, a, a story of urban India in the end, in many ways. This one is very decidedly a rural story. Was that a conscious kind of decision or was it just that this murder case came up and you found a way into it? So, uh, you know, the, the, the plan for me was to write a book about sexual assault in India because, uh, you know, it, barely two years had passed since the 2012 um, Delhi bus gang rape, which some of our viewers may, may recall a young physiotherapy student of, uh, you know, having just watched the film Life of Pi with a friend in Delhi, um, boards a bus that she thinks is a public bus, but in the bus there are six men who, who pounce on her and rape her and torture her and then throw her out of the moving bus. And, and she survives, but only for a few days and uh, then dies in a hospital bed in Singapore. And that, that death, Karen, you will remember was just uh, you know, it, it sort of brought the nation to a standstill. You know, nothing like this. I mean, terrible things had happened before. Terrible things had happened to women before. But because the details, not the details of the case primarily, but the details of who this young woman was um, had, had made the headlines, you know, um, we, we felt like we knew her. And when she suffered, we felt like we suffered with her. When she died, I felt like I had lost somebody. So the book that I was planning to write was just trying to come to terms with this loss, but actually my own, uh, my own experiences of growing up in Delhi, where expecting to be assaulted, where, 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 where assault was the expectation. Assault was always the this sort of stranger waiting in the wings, you know, it would happen, it was going to happen, you just didn't know when. So I think that's, those were all the things that I was thinking about. Um, in, and it is true that for many years prior to that, I had been working in rural India. I'd been writing about missing children in Delhi and Bihar. I'd been writing about migration in the Sundarbans Islands uh, in Bengal. I had done a lot of work in rural India and it had just felt to me like that was the nat natural transition for my work. Um, and, in, and also, you know, I mean, it's a cliche about India. Well, India lives in the villages, but in fact, India does, you know, more, more than 70% of the population lives in rural areas. And, and uh, you know, many of them are not getting the benefits of so-called modern life and, and economic success. 
So uh, it was both things. It was that I wanted to write a book about sexual assault, but um, I had also wanted to root a story in, 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 in the countryside. And um, I saw uh, a picture of the children who in the book I call Padma and Lali. I saw that picture on Twitter, the picture that I think all of us saw, two girls uh, hanging by their necks in a mango tree in a village that we had never heard of. And uh, it said something, I think, Karan, that, you know, somebody would put that picture up and that everybody would circulate it. And it felt that it had to be circulated for people to feel anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's unthinkable that anyone, it, why would you put up a picture of children who had died? And yet that was what it took to elicit uh, as a strong response as the death of the young woman in uh, the 2012 case, the, the woman whose name, again, I can't mention because of Indian law. But when I saw the picture of the children, I, uh, I obviously couldn't wrap my head around this either. And at the time, everybody, and by everybody, I mean first on social media and then in the news, they said, well, the children were raped, uh, killed, and then hanged by dominant caste men. And because it was clearly an open and shut case, I thought that case um, could be the, the centerpiece of this book that I had imagined I, I was going to write. Um, and so I guess it was just a natural coming together of the different things that had been really occupying my mind for, for a while. And, uh, you know, uh, what's, what's amazing about the book, too, is, of course, as it turns out, the case ends up being very different from what you had envisioned it at first, right? It, it is not an open and shut case and, and all sorts of new leads develop. Um, what I was curious about um, in terms of reporting it and then compiling everything was that um, you achieve this sort of very clear uh, and chronological tone towards the, to, in this book. Um, which is quite different as I mentioned in the introduction from Beautiful Thing where it has a kind of electricity in it, but it moves through time in a, in a instinctive manner. So I'm curious when dealing with this morass of information, how did you arrive at this quite different style from Beautiful Thing? Uh, what were the stages of arriving at this very clear style uh, and, and ditching that particular style that you'd use for another subject? I, I think I told you this, but I feel like in retrospect, the, my presence in Beautiful Thing was weakness on my part, hmm. that I was unable to process the information of this new world that I had discovered for myself. Of course, it had existed for decades. And I was just, I was just coming to terms with it, right? And I needed to talk through what I was seeing and what I was experiencing and the relationships that I was developing with these young women and their families. Um, I didn't want to do that with this book. I felt like not only did I have no excuse, uh, I, you know, it, it, with a second book of nonfiction to, to put myself in it, you know, I couldn't use myself as a, as a crutch. Um, but also I just felt like, you know, it's, you know, it's such a delicate story because it, there are children involved, you know, two children died and it is an enormous tragedy. And I went into it in about a, a year after the girls died. So in 2015, in fact, I was there for their first death anniversary. So you're, you're entering this, you know, uh, it's so hard to describe that village, Karan. It's just a, you know, it's, it's, um, it's just a bucolic little village, you know. Uh, I, I know that some of the descriptions in, in, in the books say otherwise, but it is a tiny little houses and narrow little alleyways and a field and, uh, you know, an orchard and everybody essentially belonging to the same caste everybody doing the same work, which is agriculture, uh, rearing cattle, working on each other's fields, um, everyone knowing each other, a very close-knit community, and yet going into it feeling just very 
unsettled because you know that it, uh, the it the family had obviously suffered a trauma but so had everybody else you know it's a it's a village of about a thousand families and the loss of two two children is felt so it was i couldn't see how i could place myself in there without causing some sort of rupture you know and also this is uh, unlike beautiful thing beautiful thing had a um, you know a, a small so called cast of characters but in the good girls padma and lalli the children live in a joint family of 18 that's mm-hmm. 18 people right off the bat you know then there are when the children went missing one search party went looking for them then another search party went looking for them and then there were police and then you know we can go into what happens the day after but it was just uh it was like a managing all of these voices was the most important thing i couldn't insert myself in there without actually just causing some sort of damage um to the to the story so uh yeah that was never a consideration although i have to say at one point one of my editors said uh nobody is believable so do you want to go in the story to you know to offer readers uh give us readers a sense of of who you trust um and i didn't but i did rework the story so that it becomes perfectly clear what who to listen to carefully it's a wonderful answer though do i do think you're being modest about a beautiful thing i think the eye does work at least for me as a reader very well in that and the absence of the eye in this one works tremendously well partly as you said because yeah you're dealing with a hate using this cliche but a truly dickensian cast right like and you can tell i got a headache reading it not because of the number of names but because thinking of how you would have done the reporting i just was like god this sentence is so nice and simple and clear but sonia clearly interviewed 30 people to get this one sentence <laughs> um so in terms of the interviews themselves one issue with this also this kind of story is that it, by the time you get into it a year later it's an overexposed case it's it's got mm-hmm. a thousand news reports on it many of them false knowing how india basically has 13 fox news is now um right. uh there's been there's been many police there's been different types of police reports political involvements the family members have changed their stories a dozen times how do you um go to people who have talked so much already and get them to give you something fresh and to open up again like what was your technique to actually get people you know when people trust you're just a random book writer showing up yeah 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 that's that's a really good question so just so the uh the audience understands what what happened was you know once the picture of the two children padma and lali makes its way to twitter which is within uh, hours of the children being discovered uh in in their mango orchard uh there the 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 ter- term badayu gangre badayu is the district in uttar pradesh where the children had lived that starts trending so badayu gangre katra gangre again a reference to the village and it migrates to the news channels and you know by the end of the day the we we are familiar with the faces of the children's parents with the name of the village which i'm pretty sure nobody outside of even that their district had heard of and uh, you know we 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 know what they the family looks like what their house looks like we know what where they cook food it's the the intimacy of the details just by the end of the day was tremendous because everybody had descended on that village even though it was 6 hours outside delhi and the reason they descended on that village was because the the, the children were still in the tree which we can talk about but there was this scrum of reporters they were literally jostling each other one of them uh, said i'm the first to get here i'm the first to get here she said it on tv you know and it, she was so happy um she said i'm the first to get here and there were others who were pushing and pulling the members of the family and trying to get close to the body so yes there was a lot of information and what happens with with this is that you know uh 
when when uh, uh, an individual is under pressure to give to talk uh, to a reporter and to give information they they speak very quickly and they compress everything very quickly right so a, a story mm. that is incredibly detailed that has oh my gosh so many loose threads suddenly becomes a, a, a three line uh, you know uh, something that they say in three lines if the first time they make a mistake in the telling of the story, when they tell that story a hundred times, that mistake becomes the truth, you know, and even they may not realize that they've made a mistake. So that is another problem that happens is that not only is the information out there, but the information can be incorrect. And in this case, a lot of the information that in fact came from family members was incorrect. And it wasn't because the family members were trying to, you know, present themselves in one way or the other. It simply was under stress and pressure and trauma. Sometimes we do not even hear ourselves speaking. So the first time that I went to Katra, you know, and, and this happens to all reporters, right, Karan, you speak to somebody who's told that story dozens of times, and they just repeat it like on rote, right? They, they, they're not even pausing. They have memorized the answers and there is no new question you can ask them. And, you know, it's happened to me so many times before you just sit there and you think, my gosh, I know this answer and I know it by heart. And why can't you break away from it and tell me something new? But they can't because they've done it so often. And so the first year was really just listening to people speaking as as you know, as speaking to, it was like listening to a recording and uh, there was no way to get people not to, uh, there was no way to get people to say anything differently. Um, and they were also repeating anything, any, any in inaccuracies that they had, they had, you know, uh, made, they were repeating those. So it felt like a year was wasted. But what happens when you're in that situation is you leave the people who, the media has descended on and you start working around them and you keep increasing your reach. So you draw a larger and larger circle around that group and you get new information. And when you can take new information to that original group of people, then suddenly, you know, it's like a light goes off and they say, oh yeah, okay. And then they start to break things down. And then they start to talk to you like they would have a normal conversation with everybody, but it's very hard and it really does take a year and it really does take your own initiative to get um, facts from elsewhere, because it's not going to come from the people who have already been besieged by the media. Well, that leads me to a follow up question, which is I was curious about what your day or month or, or year in Katra looked like when you would be there, you know, where were you living? What, what was your routine? Were you kind of just hanging around people? Were you, did you have very specific interviews? I'm, I'm curious about the life of a, a reporter who writes such a dense book where one, again, gains knowledge of so many different intersecting worlds. Yeah. So I would um, fly down from London. It's, um, I think it's about eight hours. I don't, I don't remember now. I feel like it's been so long since I've been on a flight, but I think it's eight hours. Um, and then I would immediately get into a car that was, you know, that, that had arranged in advance that was waiting for me and then drive uh, six hours to Badayu district in, in Uttar Pradesh. So you, you know, go on to the next state. And, you know, Uttar Pradesh, um, for those who aren't aware, is the largest state in India. It's got about 200 million people. Um, it is not just densely populated, but it is vast. And it is one of those states around which there is this mythology, you know, um, and, and not a good one. So, uh, you know, if something goes, has to go terribly wrong, it will, it tends to go terribly wrong in Uttar Pradesh first. So in social, any, in any sort of, you know, social development, um, uh, scale, uh, in terms of crime, anything at all, uh, people are eating less, 
um, they live shorter lives. There is more crime, there's more violence against women, more car accidents. So it's that sort of place. So I would have to get to my hotel, uh, which was about two hours outside the village before it got dark. When the mm. sun sets in India in general, somebody like me will get jittery because I grew up in Delhi and you know, the, the darkness, it, it, it conveys something different um, to me, given my experience. I thought that I had overcome it when I went to Uttar Pradesh because I didn't feel that way. And I thought, okay, well, I guess I haven't spent, it's because I haven't spent so many years in India, but I, I had these drivers who were even more nervous than I was. You know, my drivers were from Delhi and uh, they were they were not happy with this assignment. You could tell that they were just like, my gosh, of all the places in all the world, why am I being sent to Uttar Pradesh? And on one occasion, you know, I was at a, I was at a post-mortem house and, uh, it, you know, talking to the, uh, the individual who had uh, looked over the bodies of Padma and Dali. And as soon as I came out, my driver said, we have to go back to the hotel because it's, it's getting very late and it's not safe. And I said, it's 4.30 p.m. You know, what, what am I going to do in the hotel? But he said, no, you don't understand. You have to go, you have to go up, back. I mean, I didn't because I had come from London and you know, I had to make use of all my time. So that's how it was, that there was a sense of, I wouldn't say fear, but you know, a sense of just being on edge of being jittery that I would dispel by focusing on my work. Um, but I would basically, as soon as I checked into my hotel, um, you know, I'd, I'd be there for the night, for the first night. And the next morning at about 7.30, I would leave. I would go to Katra village, which was about two and a half hours away. And I'd spend the day either there or in, in areas around. And the more I spoke to people, of course, you know, the, the, the more places I had to visit because uh, while the girls' families and relatives were in one village, the police officers um, who were involved in tracking them down and the politicians, everybody had, you know, um, had, had sort of gone off here and there. A lot of them had been, some of them had been fired from their jobs for how they had responded to the case. Some had, um, had simply been transferred. So a lot of it was also just sort of old shoe leather reporting, <laughs> which I found ironic because, you know, at the center of the case is technology. You know, it's, the mobile phones uh, and its modern culture. It's, it's the embrace of modernity by one group of people and the rejection of modern ideas by the other. And yet here I was just basically doing the stuff that you know any reporter might've done at any point of time, which was just saying, do you know where so-and-so lives? And then when I met that person, just asking if they would talk to me. And they would most of, more often than not agree. I know you mentioned uh, several people who didn't agree, but was it was it that people would say, "What's in it for me?" or or would they would they be curious about why you were doing an entire book about this case? Yeah, I think people were um, people were always very gracious, very kind, but you know, uh, it's very hard to get people to 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 talk to you in, in a way that makes you confident that you can use their words in a book. So for example, uh, one important thing for me was eyewitnesses, right? Because it was like, you know, everybody saw and heard something different on the night the children disappeared. It made no sense. You know, somebody said, oh, but we looked in the mango orchard and someone else said, no, we didn't. We didn't look through the mango orchard and someone said, you know, um, uh, you know I saw, uh, I, I didn't hear anything at all. And other people said, no, 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 there were definitely suspicious sounds, but it was quite a bizarre scenario. So what I really needed was people who would be sort of definitive in their responses. But I got a lot in the beginning of um, when I would say something like, did you see it? Did you see uh, X, Y, Z individual with the children? The response I would get was, why just me? 
we all saw it because there was this fear and it's not particular to Uttar Pradesh or particular to this case. It is, I think, a, quite an Indian thing where you as an individual can't speak for yourself in a way you don't exist as an individual because you represent your family, the family, the village, the village, the clan, the clan, the caste. So you had better be sure that what you say is, is not going to offend this enormous group of people, is not gonna put this enormous group of people in a difficult situation. So, so many answers were, why just me, we all did, but we all did is not useful to me as a reporter, you know? And I would have to keep saying, yes, but you did, right? You did. And then with great reluctance, I would get, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> but we all did. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's how it was. And what really helps in these sort of situations is simply to, is, is just to keep talking to people uh, and to construct your own narrative and to offer that information back. Because when people understand that you are capable of finding out the facts for yourself, then they make quick calculations about, you know, do I really not want to offer my piece? Um, you know, I also have a stake in this, so why don't I just participate um, rather than not? And, and so that's how it, it ends up working. Great, so I, I'll ask you one last question before we open it up to the audience, which is that, you know, you mentioned the post-mortem house and um, where, where, of course, the post-mortem for these girls is, is uh, badly screwed up and, and you write uh, about the people working there, they had one job and every one of them had failed to do it. And in some ways, to me, that read like the thesis of the book as well. There's just layer after layer of uncaring and incompetence. Um, and uh, I'm curious if, if I can sort of ask you to venture a, a sort of generalized opinion, because I know the book is so specific, but it'd be interesting to hear, hear your views outside the book about why this has been such an endemic problem in India. I mean, as people who grew up there, I don't personally feel it's completely explicable from the lack of education. There seems to be yeah. even very educated people. There's a different interpretation of integrity. There's often a lack of it. Uh, there's very educated people and very uneducated people who are so callous in their jobs that it boggles the mind. Like what, what is, what is going on culturally and also what is the solution to this? Uh, so for, for the, um, for, for the sexual assaults specifically? No, I don't mean, I mean, yeah, well, I don't, I'm not even actually saying specifically about the sexual, I'm talking about just the culture of incompetence in the police, oh, the incompetence in the, in the way the post-mortems were done, the, the way bystanders just rushed, just rushed the scene of the crime. The way, you know, there's a kind yeah. of level of uncaring. It's like, what was your sense of why this is the case culturally? And also yeah. what was your sense of what can be done about it in a country that big? I think it, it is because, you know, um, India is obsessed with hierarchy, you know, and that very likely comes from the caste system. So if you believe that everything functions uh, as a hierarchy with somebody at just the one at the top or just a tiny few at the top who are in a position to make decisions, then often it's just those very few people who also have the wherewithal, who also have the knowledge. And everybody else is sort of just waiting to be told what to do and how to do it. So they occupy positions because positions must be filled. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they know what to do. Even if they know what to do, they are not empowered to do it. Everybody is always waiting for sir or madam or boss. And this is literally at every stage. If you go, uh, if, if you call up a call center and you ask a very basic question that goes just a little bit veers a little bit away from you know the script that somebody's given they will not know how to answer it even if it is a matter of logic not of business of logic because they have not been given the training and they have been told that they are not to make decisions because only boss sir and madam whoever they may be can make decisions so even at a small level and 
all the way up, people don't feel that they can, they know what to do. They don't feel that they, that, and they, they feel that if they did it, and God forbid that something goes wrong, what are the repercussions? They lose their job. You can't afford to lose your job in a country like India. There are a billion people. There are a limited number of resources. When you get something, you cling to it with everything you've got. So in a place, when, it, when the children died in Katra Sadat Ganj, this village no one had heard of, and everybody who the family encountered from the, the, the police who were supposed to investigate the initial disappearance of the children, to the actual investigators, to the doctors who examined the bodies. And, and as your readers will find out, one of those doctors was a sweeper who, uh, you know, uh, to, to politicians, to, to everybody. Nobody, nobody brought malice with them. They were not malicious people. I mean, some of them certainly, uh, you know, had, did not have the best intentions, but in general, it wasn't malice. It was just incompetence, not knowing what to do, just thinking, well, even if I do know what to do when I, but I get it wrong, you know, it's just better I don't do anything. Everybody just throwing their hands up and waiting for somebody on top. But the people on top are, are not invested and also uh, turns out not equipped. This case certainly showed that. Thank you, that's a wonderful answer. And I think you do a great job sort of um, lifting these these two girls, Padma and Lali, from sort of the sea of indifference, and and bringing them in a way, giving them a kind of life on the page too, which I which I found very moving. Um, but let's move on now to some questions from the audience. Uh, I'll just read them out to you, sure. and um, you know, and and if the, if if we have more time, I might pose another question to you too. Uh, question from Joseph is. Do you think we will ever know what really happened to Padma and Lali? I, I think that uh, we, we do know what happened to Padma and Lali. Uh, I, I think that in, in cases in India, we often do know, but I think because they are mishandled, uh, it's hard to believe what is even right before your eyes. That is how dire the, the, the situation is. There was a documentary on the BBC about a, a, a Bollywood actress who took her own life many, many years ago. And her mother, who in, in fact lives in London, is still wondering what happened to her and still placing blame where unfortunately, you know, it, it does not belong. And I completely empathize with her and I saw a great deal uh, in common between her case and the case of Padma and Lali's parents. You know, the truth is before your eyes, but I, I, you cannot be blamed for not accepting it because in the way it is presented to you, it is beyond disbelief, you know, that, that is the, the problem. But I do think we, we know. Yeah, and I think that's one of the big sort of reveals of the book is that towards the end, you you get some kind of answer, even though I guess uh, in some ways, because the girls aren't around, we, we can't ever know for 100% sure. Um, Sonia has a question, which I might rephrase because it's a bit general, where she asks, can we take a moment to honor the young women? What were their names? Who were they? Uh, in some ways, the book, the entire book is, is honoring these young women and, and talking about who they were. But I guess the, the, maybe I'll rephrase it to ask you. Um, the book is full of very uh, intimate details about them as people, right? And obviously these were reconstructed. They had passed away by the time you came onto the scene. Um, how did you, how did you, I, I mean, just like from a craft perspective, how much information did you have to collect before you could uh, put these people who had, these girls who had passed away into a living scene? Right? Like how, how, how much time did that take? And was that a very difficult process? Yeah, it took years. Yeah. Uh, first year was not, uh, was not at all fruitful, but the next three years were 
very rich in terms of information. One really vital source of information, Karen, was uh, was was a, a girl who was even younger than Padma and Lali, and that was uh, cousin Manju. Right. Cousin Manju was a uh, was twelve at the time. Uh, she was mm -hmm. the first cousin of Lali, who was fourteen years old. And cousin Manju didn't live in the village. She lived in Noida. Her father uh, uh, was a tailor at the time. Her mother. Um, uh, her, her mother was a housewife and she lived in this crowded little house in a crowded little neighborhood and longed for the countryside, longed for mango picking season. And Lali's father had invited her to spend the summer holidays with her cousins. So she spent the last, she was the, the one who was perhaps closest to them, um, uh, as close as could be. Uh, given given the circumstances of, of the relationships playing out in the last two weeks of their death. So she spent the day with them. She went to the fields with them when they needed to use the toilets. Um, she went to the mela with them. The fair had come to the village. It was the biggest thing that had happened to the children's, um, in the children's lives. And she went with them to that. So she was uh, an indispensable source of information. But, you know, the, the children had... Uh, other siblings, they had cousins, they had friends, they had teachers who who liked them, and and um, they were at that age where, you know, their parents knew less about them than their friends group. That mm. that teenage, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, where the parents when the parents think of their kids, they are actually thinking of their little kids, how they used to be, because the kids have changed so much and a distance has grown naturally between parent and child. Um, so it was their friends and their close, their cousins who, who, who were most uh, forthright with me and who had the most knowledge of who the mm. girls are. That's super interesting. Uh, we have a fun question from Eric. He says, you are the quintessential intrepid reporter. Yeah, I, I agree with that too, Eric. Um, who should play you in the Netflix series when it is eventually made? Um, this is such a good question. And I might <laughs> jinx it. I might jinx the series by answering it. So I don't think I'm going to answer it. Uh, you know, any, any super tough brown actress, uh, please, <laughs> that, that would work for me. Um, so that's all we have for audience questions. So maybe I'll ask you, I know we have a few more minutes and I did have a couple more questions for you. Um, one was how, um, uh, okay, so I guess as you were going along actually writing the book, the writing stage, what were the parts where you got truly stuck? Where did you have the hardest time in the story? In the initial stages, when uh, the family uh, families of Padma and Lali told me one version of events, and the village stuck by that version of events, because everywhere I went in the village, a member of Padma and Lali's family would follow me, and mm. when. I approached a villager to ask them their their um, you know to ask them. A, 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 their opinion of what had happened or to ask them if they had been witness to anything, the villager would glance at that member of the family and um, then talk to them and respond to their nods and, uh, and, then, and, and then, you know, manage the story in a way that did not cause offense to the, that, that family member. And again, you know, this is how villagers uh, village life is. It's a very close-knit community. I'll come and I'll go, you know, police, politicians, whoever may come and go, but good relations, as they say uh, in India, must be maintained because it's not just this family, right? It is um, generation after generation. These people have been living in that one place for generations. So you have to be, you, you, you have to get along. So it was really hard um, getting, um, I was not convinced that what I was hearing was all the truth or even the truth, but I didn't know how to get out of it because um, nobody would talk to me in the presence of the family. And then it turns out that the easiest way is to actually just go somewhere else. And then I did. 
And uh, I started going to other villages because, you know, there were there people, the witnesses were there. There were uh, more than 200 witnesses in some form, you know, as either witnessed the, uh, uh, the disappearance or the events afterwards. So that's how it was. Uh, when I got actual information, I could come back to the family and say, well, this is what I heard. What do you want to say? And uh, that, 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 like I mentioned earlier, is what worked. Well, and one of the most surprising things about the book for me was that, you know, it, as you said, you got into it because you were interested in the, the epidemic of sexual violence against women in India. And in some ways, the story ends up being less about sexual violence and more about sex and honor in a society. And there's, of course, misogyny. There's a sort of vast yeah. overlay of misogyny. But I am curious what, the, what, what about the sexual mores or attitudes of this community of villagers surprised you as someone who perhaps wasn't acquainted well with those sexual attitudes before like what what about it was surprising you know that that for, for some reason we, we seem to think that everybody in the village is conservative mm -hmm. you know i mean and it actually makes perfect sense that we would think that given how they behave but we forget that uh, a village is more than, you know, people who've been married for like 25 years, you know, there are kids and those kids grow up and they become teenagers and teenagers anywhere in the world are basically the same. They're just, you know, variations uh, of one another. And the, the teenagers in the village had a very, it wasn't a very different experience of work life because you know kids in the village from a very young age they they all go to school but they also all work very hard grazing the animals working in the field uh, and the girls especially of course they do the most work working at the house and so on and so forth but in their private time they acted like kids do they would steal away and gossip and they would steal away and talk about you know people that they were interested in and they would try and get in contact with them and although and ev that that place is awash with phones everybody has mobile mm. phones uh this is true of across india even in in a village like katra everyone is holding a mobile two mobiles sometimes the difference in katra was that because it was conservative certainly on the outside girls could use phones but they were not given phones but they could use them as much as they liked. And girls, and teenage girls being teenage girls, they would use it for all sorts of things. They would use it to call people and WhatsApp people and just like anybody. So that just realizing that they were just kids, like kids are anywhere and wanted to do the things that kids their age anywhere want to do. But that for them, the risks were enormous. Mm. And the potential punishment was, you know, terrifying. But they did it anyway, because that was the, the natural impulse of somebody of, of their age. Um, well, one last question for you, Sonia, before we, before we uh, end this. But it's been a great discussion and great answers from you. Um, Last time I mean, I, when we talked, which was about beautiful thing, um, you said something that has really stayed with me, which is that that is such a densely reported book, which I think what took you five years to yeah. write and report. Yeah, and you yeah. said, I said, what do you wish you had done differently? And you said, I wish I had uh, spent even more time doing it in retrospect. Um, do you feel that you should have, that you wish you had spent more time on this book or with this book, do you feel like, okay, I, I ended it when I wanted to, because one of the big problems of writing and reporting is when do you tear yourself away from it to actually sit down and finish the story? The last time I went to the village was on the fourth death anniversary of uh, the girls. And uh, one of the girls' mothers, I, uh, Padma's mother, the older child, her, her stepmother, in fact, um, I went up to her and I said, you know, like, do you think about Padma, you know, like, how does she show up in your memories? Um, and she said to me, 
it's been so long i've forgotten mm. and you know that's probably how she processes things uh, other people did not give me that answer you know padma's grandmother for example said i'm not i'm not dead but i'm not alive and she she has stopped living uh, in, in a way um but even her brothers you know lali's brother who is very close to her said look i mean what do I, what do i tell you it's been a while and there was a sense of you're the only one who's asking mm. and it's not a lack of love you know of course the children were adored as children are it is simply that i mean i'm guessing it is simply that you that is how you you, you move on uh there is always too much to do survival ultimately is is the focus of one's life in a place like that and i guess when they said to me look what what am i going to tell you like you know it was so long ago and we've moved on i guess i felt like the story had was complete mm. you know there was nothing now they were living they they are living in a way they're they're doing the same things you know nothing has changed for them but also it is it has moved on it that chapter is now closed so i had to move on as well there was nothing more that i could get mm. well thank you so much sonia for for being so generous with your answers and for writing a really um excellent book which i hope all of you will now buy and read uh, and it is an astonishingly quick read for something that is so dense in a way so densely woven and reported so again congratulations and i'm going to hand it over to rick thank you karan for your time thank you also karan for actually saying summing up if that's the right word um what sonia's done with his book which i really can't add any more um eloquently than he just did i do want to say to say a little bit because karan's put this in the chat a little bit of the context to that sonia doing this work um this form of writing which um the present day world of journalism is has had gone through great changes because of technology and everything else so uh getting longer form narrative journalism um keeping it um in in the world and giving its place so that stories like this really get to all the depth depth and complexities that are here um she's helped start a writer a writers collective called deca and karen just put a little note about it in the chat and it's uh, decastories.com if you go to the website and um she she's one of the founders of this group which actually includes a Seattle writer uh Mc, McKenzie uh yeah Funk McKenzie yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. and and some are writers whose books you would know and some not as much yet but it there it's a it's a great array of writers and and the work they're doing and where they've been doing it so that's important um i also had didn't mention because of all my snow distractions i suppose <laughs> to acknowledge the thing and thank uh, Tasvir which is a Seattle based South Asian arts group and one day when you do get to come back Sonia you'll get to you know it'll be an in person thing and Tasvir is very energetic and supporting um literary programs and film programs and we're very much with a social justice you know, bent that such as the kind of thing you're writing about um I know that the um woman is the director Rita Meher is on this as is Sumati Raghavan so we thank them and and all the others of Tasvir um you there's a lot you you're doing and they're doing um in their ways they um that you would find in alignment um and thank you to everyone else i know and just thank you so much again sonia because of the hour it is on top of everything else um and to all of everyone who's joined us and uh to um Karna once again for his part in this um which has been great and we look forward to seeing you in the real way um when that can be happen <laughs> um I'll write you more Sonia I've got because I realize who I know a lot of the people who you work with in England and in India I was, I was just realizing I hadn't looked at the acknowledgments so much but there are a lot of people we know um thank you again and um again as the for having me yes so our pleasure all and gladly um and take care to all um we well in Seattle we need to be safe because of the snow not to look around <laughs> but we have the other our other large global pandemic ways to need to keep being safe and take care i mean if you came on beforehand um as as this was this was leading into starting both um sonia and karen have family that they haven't been able to go see um uh, and the traveling that we that has normally been part of life hasn't been able to happen so hopefully we'll get to do that again and be in closer touch with our with the loved ones wherever they are Thank you again and take care we'll um we'll see you again when it all can happen again thanks thank you both thank, thank you, you so much, much.
Bye.